Hi, everyone. My name is Monet Redman, Director of Member Services with IADA. I have the honor and privilege of interviewing Angie Lee, FIADA, AIA, on her insights and experiences while serving on the IADA International Board and incoming president of IADA. For those who don't know Angie, Angie is Vice President and Head of Design at Pembroke, where she leads an award-winning interiors practice, providing strategic vision and oversight um, for interior environments across a wide range of scales in both commercial and residential project types. With over 28 years of experience, Lee uses a multifaceted approach that integrates emotional design narrative, technical precision, and artistic intuition in her work. Born in Seoul, Korea, and raised in the Midwest by parents who promoted science and music, Lee continues to meld art and technology in her approach to architecture and interior design. Committed to an inclusive philosophy of design, Angie is also a registered architect in New York, serves on the editorial advisory board of CFF, and is president-elect of the International Board of Directors of IADA. She also has been inducted into the IADA College of Fellows as of this year. So I am amazed and honored to um, interview Angie today. She has so many accomplishments and positive influence for others. Thank you, Angie, for joining us today. Um, learning what it takes to serve on the International Board is very important. And we truly appreciate you taking the time to join us. So thank, thank you. you. My pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we appreciate you. Um, so Angie, tell me, thinking back on when you first joined the Board of Directors for IDA, um, did someone nominate or encourage you to apply? Or was this like an internal um, desire for you to, to apply for the board? You know, I'm. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I don't think anybody uh, recommended or, you know, uh, nominated me. I, I just simply remember wanting to be in the same room as Cheryl <laughs> and her esteemed colleagues, of course. But I did a little research and found an application online and I went for it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love that you you just took that chance and stepped out on faith and you did it, you didn't feel intimidated. Um, I get a lot of questions from members who um, they do, they ask, do I have to be nominated or is this something that I can just do? Do you think I'll be a good fit for it? And I just feel like, just do it. Like if you, if it's something that you want to do, it doesn't hurt to apply. You never know if you'll get it or not. And mm -hmm. you know, the rewards are immeasurable in the experiences. So thank you for sharing that, Angie. Mm -hmm. um, so what made you pursue the role and what did it mean to you both personally and professionally to be selected? That's a good question. So I think the aspect of community and um, connectivity across a national format was compelling. Um, I am you know, a great believer in the power of design. And I saw like minds among the people I knew on the board at the time. Um, it was exciting to be next to people I knew to be bright spots in the industry. Exactly, and like forming those those uh, connections and and being in the room with those people, I know that that, that fed into your passion. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, which IDA initiatives are important to you at the moment? Well, it's a relatively new one, but the involvement of IIDA in the Interiors Pledge um, initiated by Metropolis uh, that kind of was born in the in a, uh, industry um, a round table, I think, um, with with you know, Verda and um, myself and Sasha actually on a bus somewhere great, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't remember where we were going. Um, but that is very important to me. And it ties into issues at the heart of why most designers are in the business. Um, the ability to improve the experiences and lives of people who inhabit the spaces we create um, is tied to 
a living planet. <laughs> so sustainability is tied to equity and inclusion. It's tied to social justice and good design. And the Equity Council also, uh, that's uh, happening right now with IADA, another relatively new initiative. And the simple fact that, um, you know, our industry, our interiors industry is predominantly made up of female designers, brings pretty much all the things that make up most of who I am as a professional to a higher level of exposure that is now formalized and overtly intentional. Absolutely. Um, we appreciate you leading that charge, sustainability, equity, all of those initiatives are super important to everyone in the industry. So we really appreciate everything that you've done to move that forward. Um, tell me, Angie, how has becoming a board member impacted your professional career? Um, it's been amazing. It has given me critical insight into a network of peers amongst the interiors community. Um, I have been consistently fueled by a sense of empowerment backed by data. I love that part. Um, the relationships I've formed and the validation of the importance of interior design in a demanding and tangled field that includes architects and real estate entities and the construction industry. So, you know, professionally interior designers have had to overcome many silent hurdles and having a network of support like this is invaluable. Absolutely. Um, professionally, do you feel that um, being a member of the board has kind of pushed your career forward a little bit or giving you the connections or um, drive to kind of help your professional career as well? I do, um, and not in so much, um, you know, quantitative, like measurable metrics, but in terms of this sense of this anchoring that really helps me understand personally how to maintain stamina and not lose sight of, like the bigger picture. I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I use the, the term, you know, fueled, but it's it's really um, kind of like a, um, a lifeline sometimes. I mean, it, it does get a little choppy out in the, the world of design. It's an interesting um, industry and I've heard it said accurately, I feel, um, by a furniture designer that, you know, design is kind of like a battlefield. <laughs> you need all the help you can get. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I can understand that. Um, so I want to ask a question for um, anyone who wants to join the board, but they may think that the time commitment will be too much for their schedule. Can you tell me how often the board meets mm -hmm. and what kind of time commitment does it involve? Yeah, I, you know, I wonder about this because it doesn't feel like a huge commitment. Well, first of all, we meet once a month. And we get to meet in person, you know, about three times a year. Um, and the commitment feels very light. Um, I think there's there's more to it than just that, but um, because the board is remarkably engaging and intellectually stimulating, the conversations we have and the initiatives we discuss tend to be creatively affirming. So um, it doesn't feel like, um, uh, a commitment in a way. It feels like a, a get to do this <laughs> kind of thing. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for clearing that up for uh, those who have that question. Um, so Angie, how do you organize your balance, uh, your work life? How do you, how do you do that work-life balance tussle where you're balancing your work, your personal life, and volunteering for IDA and, and other um, organizations? Sure. Well, um, my natural inclination is to go at it all at once um, and hit the most important priorities as they, as those, you know, deadlines just fly at me. <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, everybody knows life is fast and short, but 
actually as, as Cheryl Durst's mother once told her, and then Cheryl told to me recently, life is also wide. Um, and right now balance for me in a landscape of wide and synchronous demands looks like a very supportive husband, <laughs> two great kids who are finally starting to become self-sufficient. And uh, most importantly, actually, is a healthier attitude about my own limitations. So I was taught to exceed expectations at an early age and, you know, kind of overachieve, but also to discount the detrimental cost of great unbalance that often comes with that attitude. So these days, I now know not to sign up for everything, which is my tendency. And that time is, is not a renewable resource for us humans. <laughs> I'm spending it more carefully. So that's a, um, you know, a relatively new attitude that I can, you know, really stand behind. And I feel like it's, it's really um, helping to actually achieve that elusive balance. Absolutely. Like setting those boundaries um, when you're an overachiever, it's, it can be hard to do. And I'm glad that you were able to take a step back and say, hey, I need to say no to some things, you know? So yeah, our mental health is very important. Self-care is very important. So I'm glad that you shared that um, to those who may be struggling and, and um, who may be kind of hard on themselves because they want to um, achieve so much. But yeah. You, yeah. you said it the best, like time is precious. And making sure that you take on what you can handle and also enjoy life at the same time is very important. So yeah, I really appreciate that. So um, Angie, how can designers best leverage the resources and opportunities provided by IIDA membership? Um, we do offer a lot to our members. And what type of advice do you have to anyone who is uh, struggling to find out exactly how to use the resources that we offer. Yeah, so this is another good question. I, I, I think designers um, should dabble and experiment as much as they can. You know, look at all the offerings from my IDA and try to do as many of them uh, as you can, you know, partake in, in lectures and, and sign up for panels. Um, enter competitions, um, go to the parties <laughs> and see what resonates, you know, and then get more deeply involved. Um, meet people as many as you can. And, you know, you'll discover that there is deep community in every chapter. So commitment um, to IIDA offerings has an exponentially rewarding return of impact. So just do it and you're not going to be excited about everything that you you see out there but i do believe that you will find something or find someone to connect to and then it just grows from there absolutely and have fun with it and you know if you if you don't have a friend in interior design you will find one being by being involved with IDA so absolutely um, Angie, do you have a memorable experience or moment to share, um, a, a memorable IIDA moment? Right. Um, boy, that's actually hard to narrow down to, to one. <laughs> <laughs> I, could t I could tell you about many wacky travel stories or um, a few memorable drink recipes to stay away from. <laughs> um, but I think I'll share a time on another bus with the board. And I don't remember where we were going, but I do remember Gabrielle Bullock, who was the board president at the time, getting on last because she was making sure all the cats were herded and accounted for. Um, I don't even remember what she said, but I'll never forget how much she made us all laugh. And there were veteran board members on that bus and newbies like me when this happened. So um, the thing that I remember was this organic sense of, of connection and that it happened so quickly was astonishing. And there are moments like that um, 
led by people who are not even as funny as Gabrielle, which is, you know, most of us. Um, so throughout my time on the board, that that experience has been repeated. And it's, it's such a mystery to me, but this, this aspect of this wonderful, ever-changing community seems to be that there is this kind of, um, this sort of mutual respect and this drive towards the same goal, which is, you know, really supporting the power of design for, for everybody to access. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Angie. Um, I wish I was on the bus too. <laughs> <laughs> we can get on the bus. <laughs> so lastly, Angie, uh, why would you recommend board service to another member considering becoming involved? What would you say um, to someone who is on the fence about joining and applying for the board? Well, I would say involvement lets you see a process that is impressively well run and unusually inclusive. Um, I have to say that is a rare thing to witness. Um, this board is not about ego or status quo. And um, I will restate that this is perhaps uncommon in organizations. So layer on top of that, uh, an operational mission that matters, especially to you know somebody like me, but promoting good design is what we're about and expanding access to support systems that foster development and connection from um, for rather for, for, for new designers or designers who are still in school to veteran designers um, and people who are, you know, um, not always adjacent to resources. Um, so you get this, this resulting experience that is profoundly rewarding. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. You put that so well, so eloquently. Um, I don't have any more questions, but is there anything else you want to share about your board experience with IDA and becoming incoming president next year? Well, I have treasured every moment, every meeting. Uh, they are, even when we're talking about, you know, numbers and data, <laughs> <laughs> which is not my forte. It has been a privilege and incredibly um, honoring. So I'm excited beyond belief to enter into the presidency for uh, 2022. And with all the kind of new developments, it's, it's still choppy, but all the new developments towards, you know, brighter days ahead, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, makes me smile every time I think about it. And you, you make us smile every day. And we are very excited about your, your year as president of IDA. Very honored to have you today. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. We really appreciate you, Angie. Thank you, Monet. Thanks again for having me. I, I loved having this conversation with you. Likewise. <laughs>